In module four, we are going to start into the nervous system. Uh, the first part, we'll look at the organization of the nervous system, and then in, in the next module, we will uh, look at kind of how this works with the muscle uh, in order to be able to generate force, um, as well as the uh, adaptations to exercise. Uh, to be honest, this is an extremely um, information-dense chapter. Um, I've tried to pare it down uh, quite a bit. Actually, we'll, we'll go through a lot uh, because realistically, this is not a neuromuscular or uh, neurophysiology course. Um, and so I, I won't get too deep into the brain. We'll, we'll try to just pick out um, at least some of the important parts and, and highlight what you need to know um, to best help you. So with that, uh, uh, realistically, at the end of this module, we need to um, be able to understand what homeostasis is know the feedback systems, how these, how these work in the body um, to regulate and maintain homeostasis. And then uh, we'll talk about um, the primary structures of the brain, uh, be able to identify where they are and uh, what they are responsible for. And then last but not least, we'll hit into the autonomic and somatosensory um, systems. So first, so what is the idea of homeostasis? So this plays a huge role um, in exercise, but in order to really understand exercise, what we have to do is understand what normal is, right? So the goal of the body and the, and the brain, when we think of the neurosystem, is really to try to um, keep uh, the body at this kind of normal equilibrium, right? We don't want to do anything that stresses the body that could cause harm, and so anytime there is some type of stress um, there is a stress response that the brain works on. Uh, of course, uh, as we can imagine, for exercise, this is incredibly um, important, right? Because the, uh, the idea of maintaining homeostasis and having a healthy body is to have this neuromuscular function that can essentially detect any changes in equilibrium and try to alter that in some way in order to respond. So this comes into a couple different effects. One, um, in the acute phase of exercise, right? So in the acute phase, we may see that um, the heart starts pumping a lot more blood, uh, and so that would really increase the blood pressure in the arteries, and so uh, the uh, brain would then send out signals that say, okay, blood vessels, we need to do some relaxing so that we don't have these astronomically high blood pressures. Um, of course, blood pressure does go up during exercise, but if it wasn't for the brain telling it to kind of back off and relax a little bit, it would go up even high and potentially even dangerously high. And so uh, it's those types of systems so that, that we can uh, look at it, the ability to respond. When we talk about um, kind of long-term equilibrium and homeostasis, again, this is very important in exercise. And uh, one of the best examples I can give of this is the idea of uh, why do we resistance train? So we talked about in the previous model that we know that uh, resistance training is great because it uh, increases the size of muscle and builds strength. But how does it do that? Uh, each time you um, go into an exercise session, you actually cause some type of stress to that muscle. You alter the homeostasis uh, and drive it away from being in a in homeostasis, and so the muscle's goal is to um, get it back to homeostasis as best as it can. And in general, that means responding in a way that is above and beyond the stress that you caused it. And that's how it works, right? So you go in, you lift weights, and say you um, do a one rep max um, of something that says 100 pounds. And so your body says, okay, I'll be prepared the next time you're ready to lift 100 pounds by making your muscle be able to lift 105 pounds. Right? And so that's the idea is, is that you stack these adaptations over and over and over again. You build a new homeostasis and improve. So we have acute responses in homeostasis in order to uh, kind of protect the system from getting too out of whack and, and, and being dangerous. And then we have the good chronic um, alterations to exercise um, that um, are beneficial and, and provide those. So the best way that uh, homeostasis is maintained is by having uh, good feedback systems into this system. So neurofeedback is the idea that um, there is some type of communication between the nervous system and the organ system, such that if any, um, any change in uh, the environment that offsets homeostasis, that then we respond in a certain way to um, counteract that. So we have two different types. Uh, one is a positive feedback loop, and the other is a negative feedback loop. Um, I have them opposite here, but, but I'll start with the negative feedback loop because this is the kind that is most commonly seen uh, in all of physiology. 
I'll give you a physiology and a non-physiology example. A good example of this is the thermostat in your house, right? So if it gets too hot, we're in Texas, it's uh, getting uh, to be summertime, it's always hot. As the temperature in the house goes up, uh, the thermostat then senses that it's too warm in the house, turns on the air conditioner, and therefore the opposite happens in the house, right? It gets colder, right? So that's a negative is you have some type of response going up and then you have a negative um, feedback loop uh, coming back from that. So we have this exact same physiological response um, during exercise in the heat because, right, we start sweating, um, or sorry, the body senses that we are getting warm. It then uh, goes through mechanisms in order to try to counteract that effect of getting um, uh, getting hot. And so what it does is it stimulates sweating to actually reverse that and bring it back. So that's a good negative feedback loop. Again, lots of examples um, of negative feedback loops. You can just kind of search Google for that for physiology. Um, positive feedback loops, they occur, they're less so. But what happens in a, in a uh, positive feedback loop is that the, the whatever kind of feedback it's getting, it then takes that feedback and exacerbates it even more. Right, so uh, in the thermostat example, we would say that if the temperature in the house is getting hotter, the idea of a positive feedback loop would be to make the heater come on and make it even warmer. And you can see why maybe this isn't the most uh, common uh, situation, such that we're not trying to counteract some change, we're trying to say, okay, this, this, um, uh, this change in homeostasis is usually brought about by uh, some other type of mechanism that we need to then know that this bigger response is needed or coming. Uh, so one of the most common ex examples that you'll you'll see a lot um, is the idea of, of childbirth. And so uh, childbirth, um, my wife just went through it and, and she could probably better explain this for me, but the idea that there's this oxytocin, there is this, um, this neurotransmitter that are um, protein that is secreted that actually helps contractions induce. Uh, when you release it, you get some contractions. Those contractions then say, uh, we need even more contractions, and so they stimulate more of this compound to be produced, and so forth and so on, uh, until the birth. So you get one small contraction, stimulates a little bit um, of this oxytocin, uh, uh, then you contract again, this time more forcefully, which makes even more oxytocin, which makes it more con uh, an even larger and longer, uh, more intense contractions, and you just kind of get this uh, positive feedback loop in there. Again, intensifying the process. In the book, you can read through, I'll tell you, it has uh, the acidity, and then they also use the sweating. So, so go through and uh, look at those. All right, so now let's look at the nervous system, and these systems are going to be the ones that are going to respond to some type of alterations uh, in, in homeostasis. So the rest of the lecture is really going to be some very basic um, nervous system uh, structure and function so that we can build on that uh, later on uh, in the next module. So the first, uh, the major component of the nervous system, of course, is the nerve, right? Um, the nerve is, um, in general, pretty similar. So they all have uh, certain uh, specific parts. Let's see if I can get my pen out here. Okay, so the first major part that all cells are going to have is a cell body. So a cell body, otherwise known as the soma, uh, is essentially kind of the main hub of a cell. It's going to contain all the major cell parts. This includes the nucleus, mitochondria to make energy. Um, it will be uh, there for all the ER, just, just all the main components of a cell. So that, there's your cell body. We then have um, dendrites, which... Um, extend outside of that, and their job is to um, receive um, impulses, uh, communication from outside, and then send them into the cell body for processing. So you can see here this uh, nerve has several different dendrites that then come out, and in theory um, they would also have another nerve on the other side talking to each one of these dendrites. 
the last piece of this is the um, is the axon. So the axon is this um, large um, um, uh, the last important part of the nerve is the axon. So the role of the axon then is to send impulses away from the cell body and in general target some type of, of tissue. So in this case, uh, this would be going to the skeletal muscle uh, in order to cause muscle contractions. Uh, we'll briefly touch on this. This will be covered uh, more in depth in the other in the next module. But uh, an important part of that covers the axon is the axon is actually covered by myelination. Um, myelination is created by swan cells that essentially creates this uh, wrapping protective effect um, around the neuron, and it is really important for uh, improving the speed and reliability of um, of nerve transmissions down the down the axon, so coming from the cell body, getting to the effector organ, in this case muscle, much, much faster. So this is what a normal one looks like, but just so you know, they all look a little bit different. So here is just a, a nice view that this is uh, straight out of the book just to kind of illustrate the idea that neurons uh, don't just take in one size and shape, but we can uh, kind of get an idea here of how these neurons are. So you see these are some dendrites here. There's the cell body or soma, and then we have this long dendrite that may um, then talk to a couple cells. So in this case, it may talk to a couple muscle cells. Uh, that's pretty standard. Uh, here we have a a um, uh, lot of dendrites here at the top, cell body with a, with a long exon coming out, um, and you can just see that, that uh, nerves don't always have this um, exact shape as the textbook um, kind of illustrated in the last picture, but a little bit all over the place. So when these dendrites come out here, what they do is they will ultimately uh, are going to talk to some other um, organ. So that other organ could be another nerve if it's within the nervous system or it could be some type of an effector organ. So how does it talk with them? It talks with them through um, what we uh, term the synapse. The synapse is again the point of connection between two excitable cells. Uh, uh, this is kind of the exact wording out of the book and, and I use it so that I can kind of explain it a little more. So excitable cells really mean some type of cell that can respond to a stimulus, right? So in the neuron, the excitable part of it is to be able to have an action potential travel down. The same thing in a muscle, right? It's excitable because we can then pass that transmission, acetylcholine goes across, binds to the muscle, then sets off a um, action potential in that muscle. Or we could have something like the heart, right? You could have um, a synapse of nerves on the heart that will affect heart rate um, and, and different and anything like that. So again, some type of cell that has the ability to respond to that nervous system. So you send a signal, that signal is then reached by that um, cell, and that cell responds in some way. Um, so the process of communication uh, works like this. So first we have our presynaptic neuron, right? Pre meaning before. So before the synapse, um, it releases some type of neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, dopamine. Uh, these are just some of the uh, very common and basic ones. It then diffuses across a small gap and um, is able to bind to its specific receptor on the, um, on the effector cell. If enough of the transmitter binds, then some type of response occurs. Again, as we've talked about in muscle, uh, this would be um, the nerve, uh, al an alpha motor neuron coming out of the central nervous system. It would then have these uh, synap uh, presynaptic vesicles. These vesicles would contain acetylcholine. That acetylcholine would release into the synap synap synaptic cleft, um, which would be um, kind of just this small, um, small gap between them. It would bind to its acetylcholine receptor and then cause an action potential to then travel down the cell membrane or sarcolemma of that muscle. Again, that's muscle specific, but the same idea works for um, any other tissue. Um, just uh, the neurotransmitters may be different and the effects may be different, um, but they all still work the same. 
So in general, we have two types of neurons. So one is we have the um, sensory neurons. The sensory neurons are going to have two effects, right? They're going to do, uh, or sorry, uh, they're only going to have one effect. The idea is the sensory is that they carry messages from the receptor back to the central nervous system. No, no other place for it to go. So it comes, receives a signal, sends it to the spinal cord of the brain. We talked about two sensory organs um, in the last module in the muscle spindles and Golgi tendons. And again, that's exactly the, the way it works. So in the muscle spindles specifically, they have type 1A afferent um, sensory neurons that they send also about or send information about the, uh, the length of the, the muscle. Um, and so again, only going back to um, the uh, central nervous system. Uh, the other type of neuron then, of course, is the motor. And this is carrying messages from the central nervous system out uh, into uh, muscles. Uh, these are kind of what we picture, a drawing that we show that nerve. This is kind of the, the idea that we see them. So they have this cell body and the spinal cord and this really long uh, axon that, that, um, that then goes through the body and innervates muscle fibers. Um, up top in the spinal cord, they usually have very short dendrites that are able to rescind, receive impulses from other neurons. Uh, so essentially, we can send one from the brain, we can send signals down, it's then uh, um, processed kind of in this cell body, and then if, um, if it is strong enough then to have a contraction, then we will send it down that long axon and cause a muscle contraction. So uh, next we can actually take a look at a breakdown of the overall structure of the nervous system. So we've talked about the basics of a nerve and how they work, how nerves talk to nerves or other effective organs. Now we'll take one more step back and look at the overall organization of the muscle. So essentially there are um, two major parts. So we have uh, two parts here. So the first part is the central nervous system. The nervous system, the central nervous system includes two parts, it includes the brain and the spinal cord. And then the other half is the peripheral nervous. So in lab today, I got grief about how bad my handwriting on the chalkboard was. Obviously, it's clearly even worse when we start talking about um, trying to write on a um, on a computer screen with a mouse. Again, two parts of the nervous system, the brain um, and the spinal cord. We're going to cover the brain here um, in a little bit more detail, um, but I don't want to get too far. We're not going to go deep into the spinal cord, uh, but I want to give you at least the purpose of the spinal cord and what it does. So realistically, the spinal cord is this tube that is well protected by vertebrae, and its main job is to uh, essentially facilitate and hold the synapses that we need. Um, so our, um, all of our nerve cells coming out of our brain and then synapsing here in our, um, in our spinal cord. And the second uh, main role of the spinal cord is to uh, be part of reflex action. So we talked about tapping the knee. Um, so reflexes in general are some type of motor movement that doesn't require that signal to be sent up to the brain. So it comes, uh, we get a sensory, um, neuron goes into the uh, brainstem, talks to it very briefly, and then we send a signal right back out uh, through a, a motor neuron without having to send a signal that, that's uh, interpreted by, by the brain. So that's the role of the, 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 the spinal cord. Um, so the um, peripheral then we can break into, uh, depending on the book, we can break them into a couple different things. So we can break them into uh, this. The book here is actually different from this slide. This is uh, from another book. I like this uh, picture much better. But they break the peripheral nervous system into the autonomic nervous system. And then what they do is they group the somatic or in this case efferent motor system, uh, efferent or motor nervous system here with the sensory nervous system, which of course makes sense, and, and I, I totally get why the book does that. I just want to make it clear on this, that, that this kind of shows um, uh, one, two, three different um, breakdowns of the peripheral nervous system, whereas this book lumps uh, somatosensory nervous system together as well as the autonomic system. We'll talk about that a little more as we get through. Okay, so the brain. Uh, 
So the brain um, is obviously a very, very complex organ uh, and something that we could probably have multiple, multiple, multiple classes on. Uh, but ultimately, uh, what I'm going to do is just point out some of the major parts of the brain uh, and how they relate to exercise physiology. So this is really the only part of brain that you're going to have to know is what we're going to go through here. Right. So the first one is the brain stem. Uh, the brain stem um, contains the medulla oblongata, and I know that there's a water boy joke in there um, somewhere, but I will refrain to keep my cheesiness at a, at a minimum today. Uh, but realistically, what um, uh, the uh, brain stem is going to be responsible for is um, cardiorespiratory control and metabolic functions. So what it really does is it controls heart rate, it controls breathing and breathing rate, and it controls blood pressure. Um, so as you can think, these are all systems that we don't have to think about. So these are subconscious controls of these levels that are all just kind of taken, um, uh, taken for granted that our brainstem is able to do this without us actually having to think and control them. Again, brainstem, cardiorespiratory control, heart rate, breathing, blood pressure are kind of the main three that it will control. And it'll also help integrate complex reflexes. Uh, so the next is the cerebrum. The cerebrum, I'm going to do my best to, to draw this here, um, is uh, the large portion of the brain here, which includes a lot of stuff. So we could bring out the homunculum, if you guys remember that. If not, you can Google that. Uh, it kind of spells out what each part of the cerebrum really does. But I'm just going to point out one, and that's, that's the motor cortex. And... Um, Again, don't, don't show any neurophysiologists this, this slide as, as I try to kind of draw the idea that the, the motor cortex kind of sits right here. Um, again, that's very offhand. Not the, not the best drawing, but, but it gives you an idea. So the motor cortex is important in three motor behavior functions. So these include storing learned experiences, uh, receiving sensory information, and then organizing complex movement. I'll give those to you again. They store learned experiences, right? So when we do some type of movement pattern, we're able to store that and remember it. That's why we can do sports. That's why you can hit a baseball despite having such a small amount of reaction time. Uh, it receives sensory information, right? It collects information that, we're, that is coming into it and then allows us to develop some type of motor plan in order to, um, uh, to somehow integrate or use that sensory information in a beneficial way. And last but not least, again, it takes that information and it organizes complex movement. So it stores learned experience, receives sensory information, and organizes complex movement. Uh, and then last but not least um, is the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is, is somewhat hidden here in this picture uh, because we actually need to be looking at the brain uh, from the, the um, other side. It, it in general lies somewhere in here. Again, um, not the best. That's a, that's a huge, huge circle. But what is the hypothalamus? Uh, the hypothalamus uh, does a lot for exercise. So it is kind of the uh, thermostat of the, the body. So it does uh, several things. One, it, it does control body temperature. And uh, it also controls water balance and thirst. Again, as you can imagine, you can uh, really think of how easy that is to think of um, how that is affected by exercise. So um, we'll keep it simple. That's what we need to know for the brain, uh, just those three major parts um, in them. So the brain stem, which includes the medulla oblongata, the cerebrum, which includes the uh, motor cortex, and last but not least, the hypothalamus. And oversimplifying things here, and I think keeping it to a minimum, I'll get you to actually learn and memorize this small part, which I think is important. And then as you progress in other classes, it may require more in-depth. You'll at least have this as a basis of knowledge. All right. All right. So now um, let's then move out of the autonomic system. Again, that's kind of controlled by these higher brain functions that we don't actually have any thoughts over and then move in or any conscious control over um, and move into the peripheral nervous system. 
So now we can move away from the central nervous system. Again, central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and we'll move to the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral nervous system is just easily explained as all the nerves outside of the central nervous system. So that's all the effector nerves that come out and go to the effector organs or the nerves coming back from those organs and sending sensory information back, right? So we have two or three, like I briefly mentioned. Uh, the first is the autonomic system, and then we have the sensory and or, depending on if you lump them in, uh, the sensory somatic. Again, I'll stick with the book. P the first picture I showed you earlier, three systems. The book goes with two, autonomic and sensory somatic. So we'll keep them simple. So the autonomic system is, again, responsible for maintaining internal homeostasis. Right? So it innervates effective organs not under voluntary control. It works on smooth muscles. It works on gut. It works on cardiac muscle. Because, again, we aren't consciously controlling our heart rate um, and works in that way. We can break it into two different divisions. Right? The autonomic system can be divided into the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. Uh, the sympathetic division is, I think, uh, pretty easy to remember. So this is the fight or flight. Right. So in fight or flight, what you can think of is any time that this system gets activated, it is going to tend to activate an effector organ. Right. So if it the sympathetic nervous system innervates the heart and increases in activity, then of course the heart is going to increase in activity and would increase heart rate. Um, I'll say this, I think this is a great tip for most of the students, and I'm glad we get to this early on, uh, and one of the reasons I like presenting the, the neuro system uh, really, really early on, is the idea that a lot of exercise physiology can truly be described by what is happening uh, between the sympathetic nervous system, right? So if you can think about how this system is affecting and working on things, what happens when uh, fight or flight response is happening, uh, as you can imagine, that that exact uh, idea is also pertaining to exercise, right? We just use that fight or flight response as opposed to this massive ad adrenaline rush there, uh, adrenaline uh, is just controlled and goes up at a rate as necessary for exercise. So again, sympathetic division, in my opinion, is a great way to understand exercise physiology. If you can understand how, uh, what an increase in sympathetic nervous system activity would do to a certain organ, then you will know what happens to that organ during exercise. So the, um, the next, or, or the other half of the autonomic system is the parasympathetic nervous system. I'm just going to look it up in the book because they actually had a, an interesting word that I had never heard. Okay, so this, their book calls it the uh, rest or digest. So to be honest, I, I had never heard of this, and I thought this was actually uh, pretty interesting because um, I never really thought about it in the rest or digest way. Uh, so it talks about promotes normal function of the di digestive tract, secretion, urination, and defecation. Um, again, I'm an exercise physiologist. That stuff isn't exercise worthy. So when I think of the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, what I always use, the mnemonic I always think about in my head is, is para would equal to paralyze. And so you can use either one. So paralyze means it's going to inhibit or decrease the activity, stop uh, whatever that activity is trying to do, lower its ability. Right? So you can think of it either way, the rest or digest, the rest fits with my idea, or the parasympathetic equals paralyzed. Right? Either way, uh, it has two roles. One, uh, digestion and working through that, that's not a huge role in exercise physiology, but the other, of course, is rest. So reducing levels of things. So in our heart rate example from before, if we get an increase in parasympathetic nervous uh, stimulation, then our heart rate will actually slow. We'll talk about this later, but if you're curious, if you wonder why uh, people who are really highly trained and well-trained have such a low heart rate, it's because they have an increase in their parasympathetic ner nervous system at rest, which is pretty interesting. So again, if you can understand the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system, understand how they change and what they affect, then that can really be applied to so much of exercise physiology, and I think uh, will really help a lot of the concepts as we continue through uh, this, uh, this course uh, really make sense in your head.
Uh, we'll point out though that, that most organs, like for example, as we just point out here, the heart, the heart receives dual innervation from both sympathetic and nerves and, and nerve sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And ultimately the ratio or the uh, activity of that organ uh, is ultimately going to be dependent on how much sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system it's getting at the same time. Usually they're working together um, in order to control that. All right, last but not least, we will get into the sensory or the uh, the sensory somatic nervous system. So this is ultimately responsible for coordinating actions and responding to the external environment. Right. So we have our sensory system, which is our afferent neurons, a f f e r e n t, and our somatic, which is our efferent um, nervous uh, nerves that are going through. So our sensory, they receive signals from tendons, joints. Again, as we talked about. As far as it relates to muscle, right, we have our Golgi tendon organ and our muscle spindles. Um, in physiology, you may have learned such things as Pacinian corpuscles, which uh, respond to pain. Uh, we also obviously send signals from our eyes. Um, so these are all sent through the sensory division using afferent neurons. And then the other division is the motor, uh, motor division or the efferent. So these initiate uh, in our hands, contraction of skeletal muscle and limb muscles in order to um, have effect. This is our main voluntary, um, um, voluntary part of the voluntary nervous system is of course using the contraction of muscles and muscles with the motor neurons. Uh, so again, sensory and uh, motor or some amount of sensory, depending on however you want. This book lumps them together. So I think that will wrap it up for what we need in this lesson. Uh, in the next module, we're going to jump into how these actually start working together, how we coordinate um, the response to get uh, graded muscle contractions and muscle force productions, and then we'll talk a little bit about how these respond to um, exercise within that. So that's all for today. If you have any questions, as usual, uh, send me an email, stop by the office, um, or find a way to get in contact with me.